Hello friends, today I am reading class 11, chapter 7, The Adventure by Jayant Narlikar. Notice these expressions in the text, infer their meaning from the context. Blow by blow account, morale booster, relegated to, political acumen, de facto, astute, doctored accounts. Gave vent to. The Jija Mata Express sped along the Pune Bombay route considerably faster than the Deccan Queen. There were no industrial townships outside Pune. The first stop, Lunavla, came in 40 minutes. The guard section that followed was no different from what he knew. The train stopped at Karjat only briefly and went on at even greater speed. It roared through Kalyan. Meanwhile, the racing mind of Professor Gaitonde had arrived at a plan of action in Bombay. Indeed, as a historian, he felt he should have thought of it sooner. He would go to the big library and browse through history books. That was the surest way of finding out how the present state of affairs was reached. He also planned eventually to return to Pune and have a long talk with Rajendra Deshpande, who would surely help him understand what had happened. That is, assuming that in this world there existed someone called Rajendra Deshpande. The train stopped beyond the long tunnel. It was a small station called Sarhad. An Anglo-Indian in uniform went through the train, checking permits. This is where the British Raj begins. You are going for the first time, I presume, Khan Sahib asked. Yes, the reply was factually correct. Gangadhar Panth had not been to this Bombay before. He ventured a question, and Khan Sahib, how will you go to Peshawar? This train goes to the Victoria Terminus. I will take the Frontier Mail tonight, out of Central. How far does it go? By what route? Bombay to Delhi, then to Lahore, and then Peshawar. A long journey. I will reach Peshawar the day after tomorrow. Thereafter, Khan Sahib spoke a lot about his business and Gangadhar Panth was a willing listener. For, in that way, he was able to get some flavour of life in this India that was so different. The train now passed through the suburban rail traffic. The blue carriages carried the letters GBMR on the side. Greater Bombay Metropolitan Railway, explained Khan Sahib. See the tiny Union Jack painted on each carriage? A gentle reminder that we are in British territory. The train began to slow down beyond Dadar and stopped only at its destination, Victoria Terminus. The station looked remarkably neat and clean. The staff was mostly made up of Anglo-Indians and Parsis, along with a handful of British officers. As he emerged from the station, Gangadhar Panth found himself facing an imposing building. The letters on it proclaimed its identity to those who did not know this Bombay landmark, East India House headquarters of the East India Company. Prepared as he was for many shocks, Professor Gaitonde had not expected this. The East India Company had been wound up shortly after the events of 1857. At least, that is what history books said. Yet, here it was, not only alive, but flourishing. So, history had taken a different turn, perhaps before 1857. How and when had it happened, he had to find out. As he walked along Hornby Road, as it was called, he found a different set of shops and office buildings. There was no handloom house building. Instead, there were booths and Woolworth departmental stores, imposing officers of Lloyd's, Barclays and other British banks as in a typical high street of a town in England. He turned right along Home Street and entered Forbes Building. I wish to meet Mr. Vinay Gaitonde, please. He said to the English receptionist. She searched through the telephone list, the staff list and then through the directory of employees of all the branches of the firm. She shook her head and said, 
I'm afraid I can't find anyone of that name either here or in any of our branches. Are you sure he works here? This was a blow, not totally unexpected. If he himself were dead in this world, what guarantee had he that his son would be alive? Indeed, he may not even have been born. He thanked the girl politely and came out. It was characteristic of him to not worry about where he would stay. His main concern was to make his way to the library of the Asiatic Society to solve the riddle of history. Grabbing a quick lunch at a restaurant, he made his way to the town hall. Yes, to his relief, the town hall was there, and it did house the library. He entered the reading room and asked for a list of history books including his own. His five volumes duly arrived on his table. He started from the beginning. Volume 1 took the history up to the period of Ashoka. Volume 2 up to the Samudragupta. Volume 3 up to Muhammad Ghori. And Volume 4 up to the death of Aurangzeb. Up to this period, history was as he knew it. The change evidently has occurred in the last volume. Reading Volume 5 from both ends inwards, Gangadhar Pant finally converged on the precise moment where history had taken a different turn. That page in the book described the Battle of Panipat, and it mentioned that the Marathas won it handsomely. Abdali was routed and he was chased back to Kabul by the triumphant Maratha army led by Sadashiv Rao Bhav and his nephew, the young Vishwas Rao. The book did not go into the blow-by-blow -blow account of the battle itself. Rather, it elaborated in detail its consequences for the power struggle in India. Gangadhar Pant read through the account avidly. The style of writing was unmistakably his. Yet, he was reading the account for the first time. Their victory in the battle was not only a great morale booster to the Marathas, but it also established their supremacy in northern India. The East India Company, which had been watching these developments from the sidelines, got the message and temporarily shelved its expansionist program. For the Peshwas, the immediate result was an increase in the influence of Bhau Saheb and Vishwas Rao, who eventually succeeded his father in 1780 AD. The troublemaker Dada Saheb was relegated to the background and he eventually retired from state politics. To its dismay, the East India Company met its match in the new Maratha ruler Vishwas Rao. He and his brother Madhav Rao combined political acumen with valour and systematically expanded their influence all over India. The company was reduced to pockets of influence near Bombay, Calcutta and Madras just like its European rivals, the Portuguese and the French. For political reasons, the Peshwas kept the puppet Mughal regime alive in Delhi. In the 19th century, these de facto rulers from Pune were astute enough to recognize the importance of the technological age dawning in Europe. They set up their own centers for science and technology. Here, the East India Company saw another opportunity to extend its influence. It offered aid and experts. They were accepted only to make the local centres self-sufficient. The 20th century brought about further changes inspired by the West. India moved towards a democracy. By then, the Peshwas had lost their enterprise and they were gradually replaced by democratically elected bodies. The Sultanate at Delhi survived even this transition, largely because it wielded no real influence. The Shahanshah of Delhi was no more than a figurehead to rubber-stamp the recommendations made by the Central Parliament. As he read on, Gangadhar Pant began to appreciate the India he had seen. It was a country that had not been subjected to slavery for the white man. It had learned to stand on its feet and knew what self-respect was. From a position of strength and for purely commercial reasons, it had allowed the British to retain Bombay as the sole outpost on the subcontinent. That lease was to expire in the year 2001, according to the Treaty of 1908. 
Gangadhar Pant could not help comparing the country he knew with what he was witnessing around him. But at the same time, he felt that his investigations were incomplete. How did the Marathas win the battle? To find the answer, he must look for accounts of the battle itself. He went through the books and journals before him. At last, among the books he found one that gave him the clue. It was Bhau Sai Banshi Bakar. Although he seldom relied on the Bakars for historical evidence, he found them entertaining to read. Sometimes, buried in a graphic but doctored accounts, he could spot the germ of truth. He found one now in a three-line account of how close Vishwas Rao had come to being killed. And then Vishwas Rao guided his horse to the melee where the elite troops were fighting and he attacked them. And God was merciful. A shot brushed past his ear. Even the difference of a till, sesame, would have led to his death. At eight o'clock, the librarian politely reminded the professor that the library was closing for the day. Gangadhar Pant emerged from his thoughts. Looking around, he noticed that he was the only reader left in that magnificent hall. I beg your pardon, sir. May I request you to keep these books here for my use tomorrow morning? By the way, when do you open? At eight o'clock, sir. The librarian smiled. Here was a user and researcher right after his heart. As the professor left the table, he shoved some notes into his right pocket. Absent-mindedly, he also shoved the bucker into his left pocket. He found a guest house to stay in and had a frugal meal. He then set out for a stroll towards the Azad Maidan. In the Maidan, he found a throng moving towards a pandal. So, a lecture was to take place. Force of habit took Professor Gaitonde towards the pandal. The lecture was in progress, although people kept coming and going. But Professor Gaitonde was not looking at the audience. He was staring at the platform as if mesmerized. There was a table and a chair, but the latter was unoccupied. The presidential chair unoccupied. The sight stirred him to the depths. Like a piece of iron attracted to a magnet, he swiftly moved towards the chair. The speaker stopped in mid-sentence, too shocked to continue. But the audience soon found voice. Vacate the chair. This lecture series has no chairperson. Away from the platform, mister. The chair is symbolic, don't you know? What nonsense! Whoever heard of a public lecture without a presiding dignitary? Professor Gaitonde went to the mic and gave vent to his views. Ladies and gentlemen, an unchaired lecture is like Shakespeare's Hamlet without the Prince of Denmark, let me tell you. But the audience was in no mood to listen. Tell us nothing. We are sick of remarks from the chair, of word of thanks, of long introductions. We only want to listen to the speaker. We abolished the old customs long ago. Keep the platform empty, please. But Gangadhar Pant had the experience of speaking at 999 meetings and had faced the Pune audience at its most hostile. He kept on talking. He soon became a target for a shower of tomatoes, eggs and other objects. But he kept on trying valiantly to correct this sacrilege. Finally, the audience swarmed to the stage to eject him bodily. And in the crowd, Gangadhar Pant was nowhere to be seen. That is all I have to tell Rajendra. All I know is that I was found in the Azad Maidan in the morning. But I was back in the world I am familiar with. Now, where exactly did I spend those two days when I was absent from here? Rajendra was dumbfounded by the narrative. It took him a while to reply. Professor, before, just prior to your collision with the truck, what were you doing? Rajendra asked. I was thinking of the catastrophe theory and its implications for history. Right, I thought so. Rajendra smiled. Don't smile smugly in case you think that it was just my mind playing tricks and my imagination running amok. Look at this. And triumphantly, Professor Gaitunde produced his vital piece of evidence. A page torn out of a book. 
Rajendra read the text on the printed page and his face underwent a change. Gone was the smile and its place came a grave expression. He was visibly moved. Gangadhar Pant pressed home his advantage. I had inadvertently slipped the bakhar in my pocket as I left the library. I discovered my error when I was paying for my meal. I had intended to return it the next morning. But it seems that in the melee of Azad Maidan, the book was lost. Only the stone of page remained, and luckily for me, the page contains vital evidence. Rajendra again read the page. It described how Vishwas Rao narrowly missed the bullet, and how that event, taken as an omen by the Maratha army, turned the tide in their favour. Now look at this. Gangadhar Pant produced his own copy of Bhav Saibanchi Bakar opened at the relevant page. The account ran thus. And then Vishwas Rao guided his horse to the melee where the elite troops were fighting and he attacked them. And God expressed his displeasure. He was hit by the bullet. Professor Gaitonde, you have given me food for thought. Until I saw this material evidence, I had simply put your experience down to fantasy. But facts can be stranger than fantasies, as I am beginning to realize. Facts? What are the facts? I am dying to know, Professor Gaitonde said. Rajendra motioned him to silence and started pacing the room, obviously under great mental strain. Finally, he turned around and said, Professor Gaitonde, I will try to rationalize your experience on the basis of two scientific theories as known today. Whether I succeed or not in convincing you of the facts, only you can judge, for you have, indeed, passed through a fantastic experience, or more correctly, a catastrophic experience. Please continue, Rajendra. I am all ears, Professor Gayatonde replied. Rajendra continued pacing as he talked. You have heard a lot about the catastrophe theory at the seminar. Let us apply it to the Battle of Panipat. Wars fought face to face on open grounds offer excellent examples of this theory. The Maratha army was facing Abdali's troops on the field of Panipat. There was no great disparity between the latter's troops and the opposing forces. Their armor was comparable, so a lot depended on the leadership and the morale of the troops. The juncture at which Vishwas Rao, the son and heir to the Peshwa, was killed proved to be the turning point. As history has it, his uncle, Bhav Sahib, rushed into the melee and was never seen again. Whether he was killed in the battle or survived is not known. But for the troops at that particular moment, that blow of losing their leaders was crucial. They lost their morale and fighting spirit. There followed an utter rout. Exactly, Professor. And what you have shown me on that torn page is the course taken by the battle when the bullet missed Vishwas Rao, a crucial event gone the other way, and its effect on the troops was also the opposite. It boosted their morale and provided just that extra impetus that made all the difference, Rajendra said. Maybe so. Similar statements are made about the Battle of Waterloo, which Napoleon could have won. But we live in a unique world which has a unique history. This idea of it might have been is okay for the sake of speculation but not for reality, Gangadhar Pant said. I take issue with you there. In fact, that brings me to my second point which you may find strange. But please hear me out, Rajendra said. Gangadhar Pant listened expectantly as Rajendra continued. What do we mean by reality? We experience it directly with our senses or indirectly via instruments. But is it limited to what we see? Does it have other manifestations? That reality may not be unique, has been found from experiments on very small systems of atoms and their constituent particles. When dealing with such systems, the physicists discovered something startling. The behavior of these systems cannot be predicted Definitively, even if all the physical laws governing those systems are known. 
Take an example. I fire an electron from a source. Where will it go? If I fire a bullet from a gun in a given direction at a given speed, I know where it will be at a later time, but I cannot make such an assertion for the electron. It may be here, there, anywhere. I can best quote odds for it being found in a specified location at a specified time. The lack of determinism in quantum theory. Even an ignoramus historian like me has heard of it, Professor Guy Tonde said. So, imagine many world pictures. In one world, the electron is found here. In another, it is over there. In yet another, it is in a still different location. Once the observer finds where it is, we know which world we are talking about. But all those alternative worlds could exist just the same. Rajendra paused to marshal his thoughts. But is there any contact between those many worlds? Professor Guy Tonde asked. Yes and no. Imagine two worlds, for example. In both, an electron is orbiting the nucleus of an atom, like planets around the sun. Gangadhar Pant interjected. Not quite. We know the precise trajectory of the planet. The electron could be orbiting in any of a large number of specified states. These states may be used to identify the world. In state number one, we have the electron in a state of higher energy. In state number two, it is in a state of lower energy. It can make a jump from high to low energy and send out a pulse of radiation or a pulse of radiation can knock it out of state number two into state number one. Such transitions are common in microscopic systems. What if it happened on a macroscopic level, said Rajendra. I get you. You're suggesting that I made a transition from one world to another and back again, Gangadhar Pant asked. Fantastic though it seems, this is the only explanation I can offer. My theory is that catastrophic situations offer radically different alternatives for the world to proceed. It seems that so far as reality is concerned, all alternatives are viable, but the observer can experience only one of them at a time. By making a transition, you are able to experience two worlds, although one at a time. The one you live in now and the one where you spent two days. One has the history we know, the other a different history. The separation or bifurcation took place in the Battle of Panipat. You neither travelled to the past nor to the future. You were in the present, but experiencing a different world. Of course, by the same token, there must be many more different worlds arising out of bifurcations at different points of time. As Rajendra concluded, Gangadhar Pant asked the question that was beginning to bother him the most. But why did I make the transition? If I knew the answer, I would solve a great problem. Unfortunately, there are many unsolved questions in science, and this is one of them. But that does not stop me from guessing. Rajendra smiled and proceeded. You need some interaction to cause a transition. Perhaps at the time of the collision, you were thinking about the catastrophe theory and its role in wars. Maybe you were wondering about the Battle of Panipat. Perhaps the neurons in your brain acted as a trigger. A good guess. I was indeed wondering what course history would have taken if the result of the battle had gone the other way, Professor Gaitonde said. That was going to be the topic of my thousandth presidential address. Now you are in the happy position of recounting your real-life experience rather than just speculating. Rajendra laughed, but Gangadhar Pant was grave. <laughs> no, Rajendra, my thousandth address was made on the Azad Maidan when I was so rudely interrupted. No, the Professor Gaitonde who disappeared while defending his chair on the platform will now never be seen presiding at another meeting. I have conveyed my regrets to the organizers of the Panipat seminar. So, friends, if you know someone who will benefit from these videos, Kindly share it with them. Like the video and also subscribe to the channel so that you never miss any more videos from this channel. And thanks for listening.